we are going to be untangling de-dollarizing. This idea that different countries are trying to move away from the US dollar. First of all, who cares? What would a move away from the US dollar do to the US economy and to us as people? Now, as a business correspondent, I'm absolutely guilty of this, but I hate this. I hate calling people consumers. We are humans who are working every single week to earn that US dollar. And then we turn around and we spend that dollar on everything that we need to, to survive, to thrive, to enjoy our life. The unique thing about our currency though, is that it is also in the middle of all of these global transactions. So why is this global standing so important? And why is it supposedly at risk? Here's former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. If the dollar loses its status, it will be because the United States is no longer respected and strong in the world. Florida Republican Senator Marco Rubio. They're creating a, a secondary economy in the world, totally independent of the United States. We won't have to talk about sanctions in five years because there'll be so many countries transacting in currencies other than the dollar. That, that we won't have the ability to sanction them. Chief Economist Peter Schiff. My entire investment thesis has been predicated on the eventuality that this would happen to the dollar. Why is everyone talking about de-dollarizing now? Why is this some big concern? Because people are the worst. That's our guest, geopolitical strategist Peter Zihan. Peter is like this go-to source on global dynamics. He literally writes the books on these topics. He's got 700,000 followers across his channels hanging on his word. He's such an expert. We are so lucky to have him. Peter Zion joining us now. Peter, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure. I love when you describe what you do. You're a geopolitical strategist to, you know, the average person. What would you say is your actual job? What's your expertise? I help people make sense of the crap that's going on in the world today, put it into context, <laughs> giving them an idea of where it goes. And unlike most people who do that with an understanding of politics or economics, I look at a lot more in inter yeah a lot more non-personal forces with a lot longer reach, so geography and demography specifically. Uh, that gets me in a whole different sort of trouble compared to most analysts. Safe to say it's kind of your job to predict the future relationships around the world? Absolutely. Yeah. We want to talk to you today specifically about de-dollarization. I feel like this is a buzzword that keeps coming up here and there. Let's start with the basics. What does it mean to be the world's dominant reserve currency, a status the US dollar has held since the 1900s? Well, there's a couple of things that you have to guarantee if you even want to consider playing that role. Uh, number one, your current the currency you have that's in circulation, that's internationally available, has to be absolutely massive because you have to be able to lubricate every transaction on the planet, whether it's financial trade or otherwise. Uh, second, you have to not care at all what happens to the value of your currency on any given day. Because if you go in and actively manipulate the exchange rates for trade purposes, say, then no one's going to use your currency because they don't know what it's going to do. It's not reliable. It's not accessible. And that means you can't, as a percentage of GDP, have a very significant trading presence in international systems. Because if you did, you would very much care what happened to the value of the currency. And that means there just has never really been a big competitor to the United States. The, the closest, wasn't very close, but the closest was the European Union's euro. But then back in the 2000s, when they had their banking crisis, they confiscated insured bank deposits to pay for the bailouts. Now, mm -hmm. they had to do that for political reasons, but that meant economically that no one would ever use the euro ever again if they could help it. And as a result, the euro has gone from the number one trade finance currency to, I think, their number five now. So why is everyone talking about de-dollarizing now? Why is this some big concern? Because people are the worst. Uh, we always pay attention <laughs> to the wrong things. Uh, this is something that pops up from time to time. Uh, whenever the United States does something that some country finds annoying or whenever some country thinks that they found a way to crack the code, it has never amounted to anything. But we'd go through this every six to nine months. So the issue right now is you've got the Brazilian president talking about a BRICS currency and in the aftermath of the United States doing some pretty severe financial sanctions on the Russians, P20 
people are wondering if there's a way to get away. And what's turning out is there's a whole lot of nothing. So, you know, if I, you just want me to kind of go down in the battery of what's gone down here. Let's do it. Okay. So, you know, at the top of the list, the Argentines say they're all in. And I would argue that you should never look to the Argentines for financial guidance unless you're looking for ways to, you know, do more truancy. Uh, the Bangladeshis are saying that they will pay the Russians in rubles for a nuclear power plant that they could never afford to build in the first place. So it was already a dead project. You've got the Brazilians saying they're all on board. But if you look under the hood, <clears throat> you know, you're seeing some very interesting things for the rest of them. The Russians and the Indians actually got into an argument about a week and a half ago about how neither side thought the other side's currency was worth anything, and that dropped the Indians out of the coalition. The Chinese, their first and foremost issue is about making sure that they have full control over their financial system. That precludes the very concept of an open international currency exchange. And even today, with all this talk, they're nowhere near the high level that they used to have for the percentage of their trade that was handled in Yuan. They're not even back to where they were before the financial crisis. And so we've got RNC, whose relationship is a tryst. We've got RNS, who compete. We've got RNI, who don't trade, I and C who don't trust, C won't let enough happen uh, to make anything move. And that just leaves B and S and, you know, color me a skeptic. <laughs> Look, I think the what would you say is the most predominant currency outside of the U.S. dollar that everyone's saying this could replace it? Well, people talk about the yuan, but it will never be that. It, it was the euro until the financial crisis. And then that went away. The next one down is the pound. And until Brexit has figured out one way or another, it's a non-candidate. The Japanese tried to internalize. Yeah, excuse me. The, the Japanese tried to internationalize back in the 1980s and got burned because, like the Japanese, they weren't willing to open their financial sector, uh, and they will never play that role again. So every time we have this conversation, countries are like, "We hate the dollar. We want something else. We're going to go try something else," and it always burns them. And then we go back to the dollar. There's certainly been a movement away from the dollar from the time the euro launched in 99. As far as world reserve currencies being held, the dollar went from 71 percent of all world reserve currencies to now it's under 59 percent. Where are we seeing the movement away from the dollar go into outside of the euro? Because we know that that's actually the second those, largest. those numbers. Um, I'm going to challenge those a little bit. The United States. Okay, you're going to challenge the IMF. <laughs> uh, well, it's remember that a lot of countries don't publish their full currency reserve data. Mm for national security reasons. But if you look at even what is reported, it's not so much that the dollar has fallen a long way, it's that the euro has basically vanished. So it's not so much that we've switched it from the dollar to other things, it's that we've switched it from the euro to other things. And the Japanese yen and the Canadian dollar are probably the two biggest beneficiaries of that. And when we're talking about percentages, and I am going to cite the IMF on this That's one. Fine. Uh, competing currencies, I mean, even if the U.S. dollar is at about a little over 58 percent, the euro is at about 20 percent. Then the yen is five and a half percent, pound five percent, and everyone else is under three percent. So the, the difference between the dollar and any other currency is really staggering when we talk about the legitimate concerns about moving away from the dollar. I want to know if, if it's legit, legitimate in what way, just that you're over concentrated in a single asset. Is that the concern? Well, I think that this talk about even the possibility of being able to move away from the U.S. dollar. I mean, how could that happen overnight when we're still holding so much more? In oh, dollars? it certainly can't happen overnight because there is yeah. no alternative. I mean, the only other thing that people toss out there sometimes is gold, but we would need something like a thousand times as much gold in circulation as we have right now to even try that. It's a volume issue. Yeah, uh, a lot of this conversation as far as I knew from this recent time around, you say it comes up every few years or so, really happened when the West was loving sanctions against Russia. How does that play into this conversation? And when will these BRICS countries and others uh, try to make a more significant move to de-dollarize when the West is using their financial power to you know, tell people how they can act? Well, the financial sanctions actually weaponized the U.S. dollar really for the first time against a significant state. I mean, when you do it against Iran and North Korea, it's really pretty small, right? It doesn't matter. Russia, Russia matters. Mm. Uh, and 
the Europeans made the decision as part of that process to basically make the euro from a legal point of view a subsidiary of the US dollar system. So you now have the three biggest currency blocks in the world, the dollar, the euro, and the yen that have basically moved into lockstep. And so if you want to have a currency system, you have to have one that is now outside three of the four largest economies in the world and the remaining one, China, is not convertible. So you are saying that you would have to build an independent currency that trades alongside of these that is fully convertible to all of them but is not under their control. So then the question becomes, whose control is it under? Because if it's an independent authority, wow, the best way to get what you want for your country is to bribe the hell out of that authority. And that's one of the reasons why this just can't work. You can really only have one. And, and Peter, is this why the idea of the BRICS currency can't work? Because there's no possible way that it kind of can't be, uh, you know, paid, bought and paid for by somebody. Yeah, I mean, either it's independent, in which case it's the most corrupt system you can imagine, or one of the countries manages it, in which case that country manages it for his or her own economy, in which case everyone else is left on the outside. And, you know, even with the United States weaponizing the dollar, it is still the least bad option for everyone, even the Russians. One of the things that the Russians discovered when they dumped a bunch of money into the yuan is they went back a few months later and tried to pull it out. And the Chinese were like, no, no, that's OK. We don't want it back. You can keep it. And they had to go back to basically pulling dollars off of international exchanges on the black market uh, and then flying gold around because it was really the only other option they had. And I read that Russia is holding about a third of the tracked world reserve currency in yuan. Is that correct, your understanding? That, that sounds about right, yes. And, and that's a significant stake there when you're talking about global proportions for Russia to be holding a third right. of a and single currency. And, and as the Chinese have shown them, it's not something they can do anything with. Mm -hmm. I want to go back. Let's go back in history a little bit, because you talked about um, conversations happening about an independent currency. And it's not the first time that this was brought up want to take us back to the Bretton Woods Agreement, where that was a proposal on the table. And in the end, it was struck down and in, in favor of elevating the dollar as the world's dominant reserve currency. What can you tell us about that? Well, I mean, that was a really straightforward conversation. So remember the context of Bretton Woods. Those talks began while World War II was still going on. So if the Brits or the Dutch or someone else had tried to stick it to the United States on financial terms, the U.S. could have very easily said, OK, um, well, A, you clearly can't read a map. Uh, so we're just going to let the Germans hang on to that chunk while we work with the rest. Uh, so, you know, everyone was going to do whatever the United States said at that deal. And especially since the United States really wasn't asking for all that much. Uh, we basically, rather than trying to establish all of Europe and the world as a colony, which is what any of the European powers would have done, we said that we will protect you and we will provide our currency to service your systems and we will use our navy to patrol the global ocean so that global trade can happen for the first time if in exchange you allow your security forces to be put under ours for purposes of countering the Soviets. So for a security agreement that the Europeans were broadly in favor of in the first place, they got access to the globe without having to have a military, which, you know, it's something that never happened before. And simply having the dollar as the, the, the lubricating currency made sense. Uh, the only other serious proposal on the table was the Brits were saying, hey, hey, how about we use the pound? Um, mm -hmm. But we have to be able to support that because we don't have the volume anymore. So how about the United States lends us all of their gold at 0% interest for 50 years and we use the pound? And, um, you know, no one seemed to think that that was a viable option. And the pound used to be the dominant reserve currency right, before Right, because remember, this. for 150 years, the United Kingdom was the only industrial power. The reason the Brits did so well for so long is they literally brought guns to knife fights for a century and a half. And when you have one industrial power and everyone else is not industrial, they were the largest economy by far. And so they didn't care what the value of the trade was on any given day. Uh, but by the time we got to World War II, those days were long in the past and the US dollar was really the only option. If we look at the timelines of reserve currencies in history, I would say they average about a century in power. 
the U.S. is kind of getting up to that point now. So why is it so out there for you to think that another currency is going to rise and take its place? Well, I should say never is a very long time. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say never. Um, we're nowhere near it today. How about that? So if you look at the big currencies of the past, first you had Spain, which was basically a, uh, a metals-based currency based off the Potosi silver mines in what is today Bolivia. And for several decades, the Potosi mine produced more silver than the rest of the world combined. And so we got the worst kind of inflation you can possibly imagine out of that. Silver was available in limited quantity. And so if you wanted to have trade, you had to get silver, which pushed up the value of the currency. But the Spanish were literally mining the currency. And whenever the Spanish had an interest, they would go into a local market and buy up whatever they needed. Equipment, steel, ships, men, whatever to launch wars. So you got disruption, you got supply side uh, inflation, you got demand side inflation. At the same time, you had global disconnects and disruption. So yes, it was our first true global currency, but it was never going to last because of the way the Spanish managed it. Uh, the Brits came up with the pound and gold, and that was a technological currency because they had their technological revolution at a very similar time frame. And as they became the global navy, combined with the industrial revolution, they were able to do it on military and economic terms. And that was much better for everyone, unless, of course, you are one of the hundreds of countries that happened to be under the colonial uh, boot every once in a while, because the Brits really did control everything for a while. That was ultimately displaced when the technologies of industrialization went other places. And so by the time we get to the end of World War II, you know, France is industrialized, the Netherlands is, Germany is, Japan is, the United States is. And because mm -hmm. of the destruction of the war, the United States emerged from the war with an economy roughly the same size as everybody else put together, meaning we didn't even have an option as to what the currency would be then. We are now entering a period where globalization is breaking down. And the United States was already, of the major countries, the one least involved in trade. So again, at this moment, the United States is the only one on the board. Now, if you fast forward 50 years, if we get a different global economic system that is based on something else, if we find out what sort of economic model we're going to get in a in an environment where demographic decay has been going on for decades and capitalism and socialism and fascism no longer work, you know, then we'll have a conversation about what the currency is going to be. But right now, the United States has the healthiest demography of all of the G20 countries except for Argentina. It's the largest economy by far. It's the least involved in international trade. And it has rule of law. So you might not like the United States for this, that, or the other reason. But from a mechanical point of view of what makes a good currency, no one else even scratches one of those categories, much less all three. Peter, I have a hypothetical here on, on the whole I idea. Those. Well, it's like everything you say here is very interesting. And you have to wonder, you know, like you said, if there's a technological revolution or a complete economic change that happens over the next 50 years. I mean, do you see it as the U.S. is going to be the one who maybe backs a global reserve currency that everybody trade or you know that's not just the u.s dollar but it's the global dollar or whatever it might be and that everybody not only trades in but uses on a day-to-day -day basis what you seem to be describing is the dollar with another name yeah basically <laughs> yeah, sure i mean the idea of a central bank currency is really just a digital version of the paper currency and i would argue we're kind of going that way anyway um mm. they don't even have checks in the united kingdom anywhere and we're getting to a greater and greater percentage of transactions that are handled online the question is whether there's a use case for something that's separate and in, from the federal reserve's point of view there really isn't one at this point you talked about you know 50 years from now deciding to go a different route if things change. What would aggravate that change? What would what would change the status quo at this point? Oh, I'd say we're going there really quickly. Uh, oh. So one of the many, many outcomes of the Bretton Woods Accords is it changed demographic structures. Because in the pre-industrial world, we all lived on farms and kids were free labor, so you'd have as many as you could stand, plus one, because that's how you find out it's too many. Um, but as we urbanized and industrialized and started taking industrial jobs and we moved into towns where kids become really expensive conversation pieces. So we went from on average around the world having seven of them today having less than two. 
And mm -hmm. as that happened, the demographic structure of the world shifted. And so it's not that we're running out of children. A lot of the advanced world ran out of children 40 years ago. This decade, most of the advanced world runs out of working age adults with the Germans and the Koreans and the Italians and the Chinese and the Japanese furthest along. So this model of global goods exchange that we've had for 75 years, this was ending anyway. And that does shake up the economic picture and maybe, maybe make room for something new. The problem with saying that that change is going to be front loaded is that the United States and Mexico are two of the healthiest demographies in the world. And that's where the currency is headquartered. So for the country that benefits the most from this system and is most able to maintain it without changing the rules of the game, there's not really an impetus to go for something new. We have to wait for these other countries to figure out what is a post-consumption economic structure? What is a post-export economic structure? And until that is figured out, we won't know what kind of the parameters are of the new economic model. And only then can we start talking about currency. And do you think it would be something like Bretton Woods, where you had 44 countries sitting around together deciding what the new currency was going to be? Well, Bretton Woods occurred because the economic system had gone lopsided for a long time before that. The U.S. economy was actually larger than the British economy back at the Civil War. And by the time we got to the end of World War II, it, or by the time we got to 1939, it was bigger than France and Britain and Russia and Germany combined. And then the war smashed all of those. So it was really just admitting the obvious at that point. We never had a fight between the Brits and the Americans over the system. We're not going to have a fight between the Americans and someone else over the system because there's no one on a growth trajectory to battle it out according to the old rules. So for something new to follow that rough pattern, there's going to have to be some sort of global shock where everyone agrees things have to change, including the United States. But that global shock is not likely to overly harm the United States, mm -hmm. which makes it a bit of a reach to say that this is something that could happen soon. So probably, and we're, we're getting deep into the crystal ball here, where it gets very cloudy, probably what we're talking about is 30 years from now, when Germany, Japan, Korea, and the others have maybe, maybe figured out an economic model that is not dependent on consumption or production, I have no idea what that looks like. Mm -hmm. But we have to do that at scale before we're talking about any sort of meaningful transition from what works very well for today's leading power. Why do people say that having the dominant reserve currency is America's superpower. What power does it give the United States compared to the rest of the world? It's not as much as you might think because it requires you have a capital account, which makes it more difficult to regulate your own financial system. You have a lot of hot money going both ways. Uh, but it does mean that there is a stability injected into your system. And that stability allows you a lot more ballast. So a great example is what happened during the Nixon period when we decided to go off the gold standard. There weren't conversations about that internationally. The Nixon administration just decided almost overnight that we we're going to move off and go to a full float. And in the words of the Treasury Secretary at the time, it's our currency. It's your problem. Because the alternative for everyone else was worse. Still is today. So I'm glad you brought up gold because I want to talk about some wild de-dollarizing theories that are out there. And I mean out there. Okay. And a lot of this is pushed by, you know, gold investors. Sure. Saying that if the U.S. loses its dominant reserve status, the dollar is going to become worthless overnight. You're going to have a hard time paying your mortgage. It's going to be a hard time paying your bills because those dollars that you worked so hard for 40, 80 hours a week is going to turn into pennies. Yeah. Your reaction. No. Um, <laughs> number one, I mean, leaving aside the idea that the idea that the dollar is going away is silly. Uh, let's say it, the dollar did break as the reserve currency overnight. Let's just say that happened. Uh, then we're a normal currency. And we're still the currency for the U.S. domestic economy. And roughly 90% of the U.S. economy is held within the United States. And another 5% is held within Mexico and Canada. So you only really have 5% exposure to the wider world. Uh, as for all of the debt, yes, a large portion of that is held abroad, 
but the U.S. still has control over its own money supply, and that debt is already out there. And every once in a while, there's this delightful conversation uh, between some wackadoo Chinese ideologue and the U.S. Fed in St. Louis, where the wackadoo ideologue says, you know, you know, if we really want to stick to the United States, we're just going to dump all $3 trillion of our uh, bond holdings overnight. And you always get the same snarky response from the St. Louis Fed that says something like, well, you know, that would be really interesting because the... Uh, the, tr the debt would probably trade at 30 cents on the dollar very, very quickly. But I don't know if you knew this, China, but the U.S. Federal Reserve controls the U.S. money supply. And it's mostly digital now. So we would just like click a couple buttons and expand the money supply by the exact number of that $3 trillion discounted 70% and retire the whole thing. You would save us over $2 trillion in an hour. And you would be out over $2 trillion in an hour. That would be brilliant. Please do that. And then we never hear from that ideologue again because he's brought shame to China for being so <laughs> stupid. Uh, so no, uh, even in the worst case scenario where like Martian currency takes over, <laughs> the US is still a normal currency for US purposes. Now, there is a cost in that scenario that would probably force our political leaders to be a little bit more judicious with their spending in the, in the long run because we wouldn't be able to just dump our debt on everyone else's system that's probably the real superpower it allows us to not be fiscally responsible but beyond that which i would argue would probably be a good thing yeah it doesn't concerned. sound like a bad thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> a little bit more fiscally responsible yeah. if the worst case scenario is we have to balance our budget i'm willing to pay that price <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a Gen Xer. I'm not a boomer or a millennial. I don't expect everything to be handed to me. Oh, okay. Now we're doing culture wars here. <laughs> Generation wars. I got you. I got you. Um, maybe there's not a right answer to this, or maybe there's not an answer at all. Is is there a reason that Americans should care whether it's the U.S. dollar that's being used to balance trade between China and Brazil, for instance? It gives us the ability to inject ourselves into any economic exchange. And I don't mean to minimize how useful that can be. That's one of the reasons why the sanctions on Iran have been so effective. And even relatively light sanctions in comparison on Russia have been effective. Because if Brazil and China are going to do a traditional exchange, the Chinese exchange yuan for dollars, and then the dollars are exchanged for reals, or, or going back the other direction. And that allows the United States to interrupt any exchange should it choose so. Now the Fed is not staffed to monitor global monetary exchanges. So we don't do that unless there's a specific sanctions regime in place, but we have the option. And in a world of demographic decline and geopolitical upheaval, options are good. Um, this has been such a great conversation and we really appreciate you putting de-dollarizing into perspective. We're gonna be looking at those 30 and 50 year marks down the road and we'll get back on that. <laughs> Um, I want to wrap up this conversation, but Peter, if you would, I'd love for you to stick around for our segment called They Said What? <laughs> okay, sounds great. Brent, what do we got today? All right. So here's what we have. Today we have Democratic Congressman Brad Sherman. He's of Sherman Oaks. He's a Democrat, obviously, from California. Uh, there was a crypto hearing in May, and I want to play you kind of what he said here. Crypto bros make money literally by making money, and they've made over a trillion dollars out of thin air. Um, they'll accuse the U.S. government of making money out of thin air. Maybe we do, but we're the U.S. government. Peter, what do you got there? I mean, he's just kind of saying the quiet part out loud, right? <laughs> well, I would say that uh, crypto, I mean, it really depends on which crypto asset, but let's just use Bitcoin because most people are familiar with that one. It's a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, they, they print currency out of thin air and then they get someone to buy it from them. There's a second step there that's basically a pyramid scheme. <laughs> And, 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 you know, I, I know we didn't talk about this here uh, uh, during the discussion, but it, it feels like there was a whole period of time where people were saying that those digital currencies were going to be the ones that superseded the U.S. dollar for that exact reason, because they're like, well, oh, the U.S. just prints money. Why can't we just print money? <laughs> I would argue that's not a great reason. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of him saying that? That, well, you know, they print money out of thin air. 
people say the government does too, and maybe we do, but we're the government. Well, the government is also responsible for regulating a $23 trillion economic system and managing roughly $25 trillion in global trade. So the scale and the reach and the active management that is required to do that also requires a monetary authority that can expand and shrink the monetary supply as is necessary. One of the many, 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 many things that the crypto bros miss is that the money supply is not a one directional thing. And if the entire money supply is held by private interests, who has to give it up when it's time to go the other direction? And who decides who has to give it up? We have more from Brad Sherman, Congressman Brad Sherman for our listeners, but Peter Zion, we're gonna let you go. Thank you so much for talking with us today and breaking down all of the de-dollarization scare we have going on. We really appreciate it. Not a problem. Enjoy the rest of these gems from Congressman Sherman to close us out. They are really something. Well, right now, it's not a currency at all. Right. It's a pet, an electronic pet rock. In my city, the Lakers play at Crypto Arena. They do not play at Know Your Customer Arena. We're told, oh, we're going to fear of move, of missing out. Other countries could get ahead of us. Peru is ahead of us in cocaine cultivation. China is ahead of us in organ harvesting. They do not play at Enforce Our Tax Laws Arena. But some will view Sam Bankman Freed as just one big snake in a crypto garden of Eden. The fact is, crypto is a garden of snakes. They do not play at prevent drug dealers from being able to get uh, their uh, financial transactions handled arena. There will always be an Uruguay and the Uruguayan peso will always have some value. Will Mongo's coin always have a value? I don't know. I just made it up. It's a joke. Although I said that about hamster coin and then I found out there really was a hamster coin.